Hi, everyone. Uh, today we have as our guest uh, Dr. Neil Lee, who is an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, Nuo has been studying a really interesting task. It's a decision-making task where mice make um, decisions about their actions based on the sensory information that they receive. But unlike typical way of looking at said decision-making, this approach is to look at the, the entire brain effectively in the process of making decisions, uh, including the motor cortex, the superior colliculus, the thalamus, the cerebellum, and the brainstem structures. Nuo uh, began, uh, even as an undergrad, uh, with his interest in neurophysiology. He was working with uh, Dora Angelaki and received his bachelor's degrees from Wash, Wash U, then um, went to MIT to study with Jim DiCarlo, where he received his PhD studying object recognition, in the infratemporal cortex, and then Genelia with Carol Svoboda, where he uh, uh, optimized the head-fixed mice paradigm and the decision-making that has produced numerous outstanding papers on fundamental mechanisms of uh, movement generation, sensory-based decision-making. And I'm very pleased that we get to hear the latest work from Nua. Okay, great. Thank you, Reza. Um, uh, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be uh, able to present to this uh, this crowd. And I, I should say that uh, the, the work I'm going to present today is uh, relatively new. The material, the slides I prepared are uh, I haven't presented this many times, so if you uh, if there's anything unclear, just uh, you know uh, interrupt me and we'll have a discussion right there. Uh, and I should say that I can't really see you over the Zoom, so so feel free to just shout out. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this is a problem we're studying. Uh, so this is the example of volitional movement from vision. Uh, when you're looking at this painting on the left here, your eyes are right now moving at the speed of two to five times a second. Uh, so these eye movements you're making are highly precise and goal-directed. So these are the human eye movement traces uh, measured in subjects which were either instructed to remember the position of people and object in the room or asked to judge the age of the people. So you can see here, depending on what you're looking for, your eyes will take very different flight paths. In this case, scanning the room very broadly, and in this case, selectively foveate on people's faces. So we're interested in understanding how the brain is able to on the fly program this movement to achieve the goal at hand. So how is volitional movement produced? Uh, before volitional action, there is a pattern of activity in the brain that precedes the action. So this activity has been measured in humans, monkeys, rodents, and most recently even in flies and fish. Uh, so this seems to be a highly conserved phenomenon. And this activity is often referred to as preparatory activity or readiness potentials in humans. Uh, that's illustrated here in this classic recording done by Tenji and Everett. In this case, they instructed monkeys to either push or pull a mechanical lever while they instructed, uh, while they recorded from single motor cortical neurons. Um, so this text shows the action potential from one neuron they recorded. And you can see this neuron gave this barrage of activity uh, shortly after the instruction was given, but long before the movement was initiated. So this activity is selective for what the animal is going to do. If the animal is uh, making a push movement, this activity is very strong. If the animal made a pull movement, this activity is absent. And interestingly, even when the animal made a push movement by mistake, this activity kind of predicted what the animal is going to do. Um, since this discovery, there's been a body of work which has established the causal relationship between this anticipatory firing and the animal's subsequent movement. So the thinking is that if we could understand how the brain generates this activity dynamics, this will be the key to understand how volitional movements are produced. Uh, so the research in my lab focuses on two related questions. First, we want to understand how preparatory activity leads to movement. And also, we want to understand how neural circuits could produce this activity dynamics. So to address these questions, we use goal-directed directional licking in mice as a model for volitional movement. Uh, this system has similar properties as eye movement in primates. And we test mice in a delayed response task shown here. Uh, so the animal receive a sensory instruction, the detail of which is not really important. Uh, in this version of the task, uh, uh, it's a tactile task. We give object at two different locations. The animal measure object locations. Um, but importantly, they report their decision using directional licking. If the, uh, if the object is, one is in one location, they lick to the left. And if it's in the other location, they lick to the right. 
after the instruction, we impose a delay period. And in this time window, the animal could prepare for the upcoming movement. And the delay epoch give us time window to look for neural signals in the brain that's causally driving the upcoming licking. And previously, uh, during my postdoc work with Carl, uh, through a loss of function screen over the dorsal cortex, we identified a discrete region in frontal cortex that's critical for this behavior. So we call this region anterior lateral motor cortex, silencing the activities this in this region, specifically during the delay period, will impair the animal's ability to make correct movement. Neurons in this region show preparatory activity. Here is an example neuron we recorded. Uh, this is a raster plot uh, and the uh, PSDH. This shows the action potential uh, recorded from this neuron aligned to the behavior. Blue are the trials in which the animal licks to the right, and the red are the trials uh, are in which they lick to the left. And you can see this persistent level of activity during the delay that predicted lick right. Other neurons in this region uh, would become active. They have the opposite preference. They become active during lick left. And uh, at the level of individual neurons, uh, we found that the, uh, you know, the activity is highly diverse and individual neurons have very complex temporal patterns. So to really be able to understand this activity pattern, we have to consider this activity at the level of the neural population. So at the level of ALM population activity, this preparatory activity can be represented as trajectories that converge onto discrete locations. So in this activity space, individual dimensions correspond to the activation of individual neurons. And there will be two locations corresponding to two distinct patterns of activity. One would predict leg right movement, and the other would predict leg left movement. And thinking is that before the animal specific movement, the activity would converge onto these two locations, which would then predict leg left, leg right. This is a conceptual framework pioneered by Shinoise and colleagues in the context of motor preparation. And under this conceptual framework, we can try to visualize ALM activity preceding the directional licking. So to do that, I'm gonna simplify the problem even further by performing dimensionality reduction uh, in which we're gonna estimate only a single dimension, which I'll call the choice dimension in the activity space. So this is the direction that maximally separate the lick left and lick right trajectories. And what I'm going to show you now is the ALM population activity projected on this single dimension. I'm going to show you its evolution over time, OK? So a typical recording session looks like this. Uh, in fact, this is one of our latest recordings using the NeuroPixel 2 probes, in which now we can record from hundreds of neurons simultaneously, from which we can get these very beautiful single trial trajectories. So you can see that these trajectories will begin to diverge from each other during the late sample epoch. And by the end of the delay, they have kind of uh, converged onto these two spots on the choice dimension, one corresponding to lick right and the other corresponding to the lick left. And over the past few years, multiple experiments we have done show that there is really a close correspondence between these locations on the choice dimension and the animal's future movement. So first of all, the distance of these single trial neural trajectories to these endpoints would predict whether the animal would lick left or lick right on single trials. And this is the case even on error trials. So to show you this here, what I've done is I took those neural trajectories and I simply ranked the trajectories based on their position on the choice dimension at the end of the delay. This is the moment right before the, uh, the animal uh, is gonna initiate movement. And we found that if the trajectory is closer to the lick right endpoint, the animal will lick to the right about 90% of the time. And in reverse, if the trajectory is closer to the lick left endpoint, the animal will lick to the left most of the time. But more importantly, this relationship holds even under conditions in which ALM activity is perturbed. So imagine the following scenario, okay? So if a trajectory is initially proceeding toward one of the locations in the activity space, and imagine we do a perturbation in the middle and we push the activity into the opposite location, the question then is, would we then cause the animal to lick in the opposite direction? So this is exactly what we have done. So in one set of experiment, uh, we bilaterally inhibited ALM activity, trans and we did this transiently during the early delay epoch. And this perturbation is quite large. So after the perturbation, what we found is that then the subsequent activity in ALM become random. So 50% of the time, the activity will still go to this trajectory uh, endpoint, but the other 50% of the time, it will, now flag, uh, it will now change course and go to the opposite endpoint. 
Now, importantly, if we take those perturbed activity trajectory, and again, we rank them along this choice dimension, we get back the same relationship. That is, if the activity, if the perturbed activity ended up closer to the lick right end point, the animal will still lick to the right about 90% of the time. And if it changes course and go to the opposite end point, the animal will lick to the left 80% and 90% of the time. And I just want to mention, which is a very important point, that in this case, the animal is essentially licking randomly with respect to, sen uh, to the, to the uh, sensory instruction. So if you look at their performance in the task, their performance is near chance level. And yet, simply by taking the single trial ALM activity trajectory along this choice dimension, we can predict reliably on single trials what the animal is going to do. So this shows us that there is almost an obligatory relationship between these uh, act ALM activity along this choice dimension and what the animal is going to do behaviorally. So um, altogether, we think, you know, by this, by way of summary, so this background work has led us to believe that we think we have identified a neural correlate of volitional licking in the mouse brain. This preparatory activity can be described as trajectories that converge onto discrete locations in the activity space, and these different locations correspond to different movement. Uh, Neil, okay. may I ask a question? Yes. Um, it, it is surprising that the perturbation trials still end at the you've drawn it at least at the same component of the state space. Is it, does that surprise you or is that something that you expected? Um, this is uh, quite surprising with hindsight, uh, in hindsight, because um, uh, as I will show you later, as the talk progresses, I will show you different kind of perturbation data. And I think uh, the perturbation in ALM is quite unique in that if you perturb cortex, you know, the activity will still recover back largely along this choice dimension. They don't go into dimensions that they don't normally go. Um, and this has been a feature uh, for many of the regions we perturb, uh, but this is not the case for other regions. And I, I would just say that, you know, this is kind of the findings that's uh, kind of motivated our thinking about how we think about volitional movement. And hopefully this, I'll, I'll tie this back together at the very end of the talk for you, okay? Okay, so so this I think uh, just by ways of background, we established a system which we can we think we can begin to address longstanding mechanistic questions about motor preparation. And today I'm going to tell you about two projects uh, about how neural circuit could support this activity dynamics. So in the first project, our goal is really to understand something about the nature of this activity dynamic, and specifically we want to know what do these locations in the activity space reflect. So for preparatory activity, these locations, they correspond to a persistent activity state. This means that these two spots, they are two patterns of persistent activity that are maintained by recurrent networks in motor cortex and connected brain regions. And mechanistically, people think that this, uh, this could be thought of as two discrete attractors. At least this is consistent with the modeling work that kind of could recapitulate this activity dynamic. But the question we have is, that are these attractors defined by subsequent movement execution? Or alternatively, could they be abstract patterns of activity that's acquired by the network through learning? So if you think about this from the framework of the dynamical systems framework, these activity states, they serve a functional purpose. So these activity states act as initial conditions for the subsequent network dynamics controlling movement execution. So the idea is that if the network is able to recapitulate one of these activity patterns, this will then readily trigger the network dynamics, subsequent network dynamics that controls movement execution. And if this framework is correct, then would this suggest there would be a unique initial condition for every subsequent motor output pattern? So if they are unique, this has to be maintained by the motor circuit over time. And this question is relevant when we think about how learned actions are retained in motor memory over long term. So in our lifetime, we can learn many motor skills. And many of these motor skills, once we learn them, we can retain them for uh, most of our lifetime. For example, uh, I learned to ride a bicycle when I was a kid. I haven't ridden a bicycle in a long time, but I can still get on a bike today without falling. So the question becomes, if we were able to generate the same motor output pattern throughout our lifetime, would this then require the same initial conditions be maintained over time? 
And here comes a, a bit of a conundrum. So if you look at the underlying neural circuits controlling movement, the motor cortical circuits are highly unstable. So on the left here is a structural imaging study looking at layer five parental neurons. So in this study, uh, the authors tracked synaptic spines in vivo. So these are tiny little protrusions on the dendrite. And they found that the synaptic spines are added and removed over the course of days. And in this study, when they tracked these individual spines in vivo, they found about 40% of the spines turn over in a matter of days. So at the same time, the motor cortical activity is also unstable. So in this study, Lee and Busy, they trained monkeys to make reaching movement to different target. They then applied a force field to the manipulator, uh, a manipulation perhaps well known to this audience. Uh, the animal then learned to adapt to this force field. And after motor learning, they removed this force field. And you can see the effect on the animal's hand reaching trajectory, where they counter curl their uh, reaching direction to counter the effect of this force. But after some washout period, the movement returned to normal. But interestingly, when they measured the activity of motor cortical neurons, they found the tuning of many motor cortical neurons has been persistently altered by this experience. And you can see that in this neuron, this neuron initially had a direction preference of 90 degrees, but after this experience, the tuning has rotated by about 45 degrees. And interestingly, even after, even during the washout period, when the movement has returned to normal, this tuning has been uh, persistently altered. So it seems the neural representation of the movement has been persistently altered by this intervening training. So then the question is becomes, how are we able to uh, stably retain our existing motor repertoire given that we're continuously acquiring new motor skills? So based on these findings, theories of learning propose a memory storage mechanism based on unstable representations. So in a redundant neural network, uh, there are multiple, if there are multiple network configurations, meaning there are multiple synaptic pat uh, patterns of synaptic waves that can produce the same network output, then the output uh, activity pattern within this network could change while still maintaining the same output. So there is ex experimental evidence for this. This is commonly referred to as representational drift. In this study, uh, Driscoll and Harvey, they imaged the same neurons in parietal cortex when animals, uh, when mice were navigating a virtual corridor, and they found that the choice selective activity in parietal cortex could change over time. So here they sort the choice selective uh, ac activity of parietal neurons uh, by their peak, and you can see the same neurons by day 20, that activity is largely gone. And similar findings since then has been reported in hippocampus and the number of sensory systems. Now, I want to point out that one challenge associated with this type of experiment is that the animal's behavior could change in subtle ways, which could complicate the interpretation of the activity change. So to address these questions, uh, we developed a continual learning paradigm uh, for the mouse to track the neural representation of licking across multiple task learnings. So first, we train mice to perform the lick left, lick right task instructed by the tactile cue. This is the same task I showed you earlier. And then after the animal learned this task, we then change the sensory motor contingency where the same tactile stimulus is now instructing the opposite leg direction. And the continuous reversal specifically allowed us to change the task context without changing the sensory stimuli nor the motor actions within the task. So it turns out this was a very difficult task for the animal to learn. To help with training, we then developed a automated home cage training system in which the mice can head fix themselves and be trained by a computer program 24 seven without human intervention. So in this video, you can see this mouse uh, coming into uh, and uh, this system voluntarily engage in head fixation, perform this directional licking task in their home cage. After a while, they will disengage from the behavior and go back. And in this way, we can continuously train them without any human in the loop. Here's the performance data from an example mouse in the system over collected over the course of two months. Uh, you can see these are the performance curves in percent correct. The performance will gradually increase uh, over learning, uh, but then upon contingency reversal, which is indicated by this gray line, the performance drops, but over the course of learning, the animals recover its performance, and then we impose another contingency reversal. And in this manner, the animals can continue this, they learn many rounds of sensory motor contingency reversal over several months. Um, we built many of these boxes uh, so we can perform this type of training in high throughput, enough throughput to support the neurophysiology experiment. 
Okay, so the first question we had was, does this behavior actually require ALF? So it's been suggested that when the animals are overtrained in a motor behavior, then the motor cortex may become disengaged from behavior. So here to test this notion, we developed a, a approach for performing optogenetic manipulations in the home cage. So to do that, what we did is we expressed a, a red-shifted channel rhodopsin in the GABAergic neurons uh, of ALM. And we did this by virally delivering this, uh, this uh, um, uh, opsin into the GABAergic neurons. We then, during periods of head fixation, we can then use red light to directly stimulate uh, ALM through the intact skull. And we found that and by activating these GABAergic neurons, we can then inhibit the local parameter neurons, thereby shutting down this cortical area. And we found that when we perform this inhibition, even in highly trained animals, their performance would degrade severely. And I should say that this perturbation was done specifically during the delay period. And we found if we inhibit ALM activity during the delay, the animal could not make the correct lick, uh, directional licking. So this suggests to us that the ALM is driving the learned directional licking, and this is the case even in overtrained animals. And furthermore, using high-speed video tracking, we measured the tongue and jaw kinematics, and we found these to be highly preserved over time. So now using, by combining this paradigm with chronic two-photon imaging of the ALM activity, we can now track the neural representation of the same actions across continual learning. Okay, so first we want to know, does ALM activity remain stable over time in absence of any new task learning? So after animal learn the task in the home cage, um, I should say all the experiment I'm going to show you is performed by an incredibly talented postdoc, uh, Jae Hyun Kim. Um, so in this case, after the animal learned the task, uh, Jae Hyun then transferred them to a two photon microscope where they performed the same task under the microscope and he tracked the same ALM neurons uh, over time. And he found that their ALM activity is quite stable. So to demonstrate this, he sorted the ALM activity by their peak uh, activity uh, on day one. And you can see by day 30, largely the same activity pattern is maintained. We can further ask, does the encoding of licking remain stable? Now, I told you earlier that preparatory activity can be represented as trajectories uh, on this choice dimension uh, in the activity space. So here, what we can do is we can estimate this choice dimension using the activity on day one. And you can see if we project the activity here, this shows good separation between lick left, lick right during the delay. If we take the activity from day 16, project it on the same choice dimension, we get back a similar looking activity. And this is the data from one example session. Here's a summary data for all the sessions we did. Um, and uh, Using the same choice dimension, we found we can reliably decode leak direction for up to two months, which is the longest time we measured. In fact, this last data point, you can see a hint of activity decreasing. The reason for this is because this particular mouse and field of view had a lower decoding to begin with. These different colors show data from different mice. If we fit regression lines to the data for individual mice, we could detect no significant decrease in the decoding performance. So this shows that the activity remains stable within a task without any new task learning. So what happens to ALM preparatory activity upon learning a new task? So after imaging the animal's activity in task one, Jae then returned these mice back to the home cage where they can learn the reversed contingency. Then after learning, Jae Hyun take these mice back to the microscope and image their activity again, now performing the second task. And here he observed a profound reorganization of ALM preparatory activity. So to show you this here, we sorted the neurons activity based on uh, their preference in task one. So uh, you can see here, uh, there are neurons that prefer lick right during the delay period. And this is the activity on lick left trials where the same neurons, there are neurons that prefer lick left uh, 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 that's on the bottom. If we keep the sorting of the neurons and we look at their activity again in task two, that activity has completely disappeared, or I should say reshuffled. We can take the same population of neurons and we can resort them based on their preference in task two. We still get neurons that prefer lick right and lick left. But if we look at the same neurons activity, look at back their activity in task one, that activity was largely absent. So altogether, um, and similarly, we can quantify the decoding of licking um, 
if we estimate a choice dimension based on the activity in task one, you can see ta uh, the activity shows nice separation for leak left, leak right. If we project the activity in task one onto this choice dimension, that activity has largely collapsed. And using a decoder trained in task one, uh, we would be decoding leak directions at chance levels on average. So altogether, this data show us that learning has created a new pattern of preparatory activity, even though it is used to drive the exact same actions. And I just want to mention also here that although we observe this remapping of preparatory activity on average, we did find a huge degree of individual variability. And I'll call your attention to this huge spread of scatters in the leak direction, uh, in the leak direction decoding. So it turns out in most mice, we observe this activity remapping, but in a subset of the mice, uh, the activity seemed to remain stable. And we currently believe this variability is due to individual differences in their motor cortical circuits. And I think we finally made some headways in understanding this variability. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to ask me about this at the very end. Okay, so does this mean that the previous preparatory activity pattern has been lost? Has this been erased by the intervening experience? So to test this, we then retrained mice in the previous task. What we did is we then returned these mice back to the home cage after the imaging their activity in task two. They then relearn the previous task context. We then take them back to the two photon microscope and image their activity again. And here, I just want to point out that these experiments Jae Hyun did, they now span, some of them span up to three months. So, and in the lifetime of humans, uh, this would be about, about 10 years of human lifetime. So this is really for the first time we're able to track the neural representation of the same actions across a significant span of the animal's lifetime. And to our great surprise, the previous activity patterns are not lost. In fact, they remained remarkably stable for up to three months. So to show you this, we estimate a choice dimension in task one. You can see this activity shows good selectivity. The activity collapses in task two, but upon retesting in task one three months later, the same activity pattern reemerged. Here is a summary of all the fields of view we collected. Uh, here is the decoding performance. You can see a decoder trained in task one does poorly in task two, but recovered its performance in task one. And in a subset of the mice, Jason was even able to further push these mice out for one more reversal. He was able to test task two uh, again, and again, the decoder does poorly. So altogether, these results show us that the motor learning has really created a context specific preparatory states. And once learned, this activity state seems to be highly stably stored and they can, it can be recalled even after many months despite the intervening task learning. So very interestingly, we found that this remapping seems to only happen to the preparatory activity. It seems to primarily happen to the, to the ALM activity during the delay period. If we look at ALM activity during the sample epoch, uh, these are the activity related to the sensory stimulus, or if we look at the ALM activity during the response epoch, these are the activity during movement execution, we found ALM activity maintained its activity um, across all task contexts in those epochs. So to show you this here in the top, I sorted the neurons by their preference to object location, posterior or anterior, and you can see the same activity patterns preserved across task context uh, with similar decoding performance. And similarly here below, we, I sorted the uh, neurons based on their preference to leak direction during the response epoch and similar pattern of activities maintained with high decoding performance. So this remapping across task context seems to specifically happen to the preparatory states. And we believe that these preparatory activity states perhaps reflects a context-specific motor memory of the task. Okay, so does this mean that learning in new task context will just keep creating new preparatory states? So, so far our imaging experiment looked at only two task contexts. And furthermore, you can say the contingency reversal may be a special case of a uh, task context switch because um, you know, the animal here has to forcefully reverse a previously learned sensory motor mapping. And maybe there is some weird strategy the animal has to use. So to test this, we then train mice in yet a third task in which we now instruct the same directional licking, but using a novel auditory stimulus. In this case, the animal lick left, lick right based on the frequency of the tone. 
And in this new task, we observe yet a new pattern of preparatory activity. So here to show you just the summary data, uh, a decoder trained in task one would be decoding at very low level for task two and task three. A decoder trained in task two also could not generalize to task three. So it seems that learning in new task context will just, will just keep creating preparatory states. Okay, so to summarize what I showed you so far, we found that these preparatory states um, seems to be a learned activity state. These activity state, they encode learned actions within specific task context. And once learned, these preparatory states are highly stable and they can be recalled even after many months. Now, interestingly, this work also showed that these preparatory states, they seem to be not unique for each action. In fact, I've shown you that the same linking action can be triggered by multiple different preparatory states. We think what this allows the motor system to do is that it gives the motor system an extra degree of freedom. And with this afforded extra degree of freedom, the motor cortex now can create multiple representations for the same action, essentially one representation for each context. And we think this context-specific code is advantageous in protecting, in protecting the existing motor memories from erasure by continual learning. So essentially, whenever we learn a new motor skill, a new representation is formed rather than modifying the existing representation. And this could then in turn protect the existing motor repertoire from catastrophic forgetting. Okay, so now in the next part of the talk, I wanna switch gear a little bit. I wanna tell you about our effort in dissecting the neural circuits that could be supporting these activity dynamics. So as I've shown you, these preparatory states are thought to be maintained uh, by these discrete attractors uh, along the choice dimension. And what we found here is that these attractors are not fixed, but they seem to exist only within specific task context. So then the question becomes, what is a mechanism that could activate attractors in a context-specific manner? And how is this implemented? How could this be implemented by neural circuits? Okay, so, so far I've been telling you about this one dimension in activity space, this choice dimension. This is again the dimension that maximally separates the big left and big right trajectory. If we take a step back and we perform dimensionality reduction on the ALM delay activity as a whole, we will find that the ALM activity, it lays on a two dimensional manifold where two dimensions capture most of the activity variance during the delay. A second prominent component of ALM activity shows a ramping signature. And this ramping dimension in the activity space is orthogonal to the choice dimension, and it has very interesting properties. So here, what I'm showing you is the activity projected on this ramping dimension. You can see this activity ramps up. It is not selective for leak direction, and it ramps up just and to reach a peak just before movement onset. And this ramping signal seemed to have a similar time course as the cho choice dimension. It is almost as if the, the choice selectivity only develops in the presence of this ramp. And we currently believe this ramping signal reflects perhaps a volition signal that reflects the animal's urge to move. If the animal do not move, then this ramping signal is absent. And interestingly, in the absence of this ramping signal, the choice activity also doesn't develop fully. If we train the animals to initiate movement later, we can do this by training them in a task with the longer delay duration. The animal has to learn this timing. And once they learn this timing, what happened is that this ramping signal will slow down so that it ramps much more slowly now such that it could reach a similar peak just before movement onset as if it's anticipating the future time of the movement onset. And its time course again dictated how the choice signal could develop. And in other cases, if the animal, while they're performing this behavior, they spontaneously decide to lick uh, early in absence of any goal cue. And if we align these activity, ALM activity to these self-initiated licks, we can again see this ramping signal emerges and reaches a peak before the licking response. And interestingly, in the presence of this ramp, the choice, develop, uh, choice signal develops and this choice signal would predict the direction of the licking. So, Based on this data, our current hypothesis is that this ramping signal may play a permissive role for the choice signal to develop. So previous computational works has shown that an external input 
to a recurrent neural network could reshape the energy landscape of recurrent neural networks. And our thinking is that the same mechanism here could be used to dynamically establish discrete attractors that encode potential future actions. So this ramp, we think, may reflect a relation signal that would activate a set of learned attractors. And these learned attractors would define a set of potential actions that's available to the animal in a particular context. So if the animal is in a different context, then we think a different ramp would be evoked, perhaps along a different dimension in the activity space, and this different ramp would activate a different set of attractors. So in this scheme, when we plan actions, I think the full extent of our motor repertory is actually not fully available to us. Rather, this ramp perhaps reflects an internal model of learned actions within specific contexts. So this is the, only a speculation. This is our working hypothesis. We're doing experiment to test this idea now. I won't talk about those work instead, but I want to use this as a framework, and I want to tell you about our work in finding the so potential source of this ramping signal. OK, so so far, I've been focusing on this ALM region. Uh, this ALM region, now we know, is part of a broader multi-regional network. Shown here is the reconstruction of the ALM anatomical projections. And this reveals an extensive network stretching across a number of subcortical regions, including the basal ganglia, the thalamus, midbrain, and the cerebellum. And we currently believe the preparatory activity is mediated by this cortical-subcortical network. And in the last five years, going back to Reza's question, we actually have performed a number of perturbation experiments aimed at different parts of this network in order to examine their contribution to this preparatory activity. So first of all, we find that if we silence the thalamus, then both the choice and the ramping signal collapses. This suggests to us that the, these activity modes are likely related to ALM through the thalamus. The thalamus uh, integrates input from a number of subcortical regions. Um, many of these regions also receive ALM input. This then forms secondary long-range loops, and we currently think these activity modes are orchestrated by these subcortical loops. And interestingly, we find that the choice and ramping may be partly mediated by different circuits, and they could be experimentally dissociated in some cases, this is the reason we think these are actual signals and not just the artifact or an, of our analysis. So for example, we find that the choice activity seems to evolve competition mechanisms within the superior collicula. So in a recent study, we found that if we optogenetically modulate the activity in the superior colliculus, we could predict, predictably bias the ALM activity uh, along the choice mode to one choice or the other. But most interestingly, we found that this effect did not affect, uh, this perturbation did not affect the ramping mode at all. So this suggests to us that the source of the ramping uh, perhaps reside outside of the ALM colliculus loop. So where could this choice uh, ramping signal be coming from? So, so right now our eyes are on the cerebellum. So in a previous study, we found that the ALM preparatory activity depends on the cerebellum. If we silence, the output of the cerebellum, the vestigial nucleus specifically, this then completely collapses both the choice mode and the ramping mode. And very interestingly, we found a, a very intriguing effect, which is very different from any other perturbation we have done uh, in the ALM, in thalamus, in midbrain. And the effect is as the following. We found that if we transiently perturb the cerebellar nuclei with channel adoption in this case, this would not only abolish existing patterns of persistent activity in ALM. And instead, what this does is that this evokes an entirely new patterns of activity in ALM, a pattern which we have never seen before. And this pattern of activity would persist long after the stimulation for the entire duration of the delay. It's as if a new attractor is being activated by this perturbation. So here I show you three example neurons to illustrate this effect. So you can see this top neuron normally exhibit uh, persistent activity during the delay that's selective for leak right. But upon a transient perturbation of the cerebellar nuclei, showing the cyan bar, the activity is turned off and it remained off for the duration of the delay. The second neuron normally didn't exhibit any persistent activity, but upon a perturbation of the cerebellar nuclei, 
this created a new pattern of persistent activity, uh, which lasted for the entire duration of the delay and turned off when the animal initiated its response. And finally, the third neuron didn't exhibit any activity during the delay, but upon a perturbation, it now created a new pattern of persistent activity that's selective for Nick lab. So these data led us to hypothesize that perhaps the cerebellum is providing this ramping signal that activates these attractors in ALM. Okay, so how could this ramping signal be generated? Our current thinking is that this involves an interaction between the neocortex and the cerebellum. So the neocortex and the cerebellum, they're reciprocally connected through pons and thalamus, and these two structures are known to be co-active during cognitive functions. But what we don't really know is how these two structures interact, who drives who, and which specific regions of these two structures, how they form into networks. So earlier anatomical tracing studies in non-human primates suggest this kind of a circuit architecture in which um, specific region of the neocortex would project to specific regions of the cerebellum, and that same cerebellar region would project back to the same cortical regions. And in turn, this would form parallel closed loops where each loop would support a specific function. So if this architecture is correct, would this mean that there would be dedicated region of the cerebellum that compute this ramping? And, or alternatively, might this signal be, be more distributed? So to examine this question, a postdoc uh, in the lab, Jia Zhu, he teamed up with a student, uh, Hannah hassan Bekovic, and our collaborator, uh, Gao Zhenyu at uh, Erasmus MC, where together they mapped this ramping signal in the cerebellum in relation to the cortical cerebellum connectome. And for consideration of time, I'm just going to blaze through this part of the talk because this work has been published. If you're interested, I encourage you to go uh, dig up the details. And I think Gao also presented some of this work here in the seminar recently. Uh, so long story short, what we did is we used a transsynaptic virus to map the ALM input into the cerebellum. These are shown in orange. These, re these are the region of the cerebellar cortex that receive ALM input via pons. At the same time, we also mapped the cerebellar regions projecting back to ALM using this uh, another viral approach. And these regions are showing green. So these are the cerebellar regions that project back to ALM through the vestigial nucleus and the thalamus. And in short, we did not find parallel closed loop. Um, instead, we found what we found is largely divergent and open loop connectivity between cortex and the cerebellum. So you can see that these regions that receive ALM input, they're primarily concentrated in the lateral hemispheres and they're misaligned with these green regions. The regions that project back to ALM are primarily concentrated in the vermal regions. Nevertheless, if we compare these two maps closely, we did find pockets of areas, which are highlighted by these circles, which have a conjunction of input connectivity and output connectivity. So we call these region hotspots, and these hotspots cover parts of simplex, parts of Cruz 1, 2, and the uh, posterior vermal regions. So next, what Jia did is she then used silicon probes to make recordings throughout the large swaths of the cerebellum. And in some of her recordings, she did find neurons in cerebellum with preparatory activity similar to ALM neuron. So here is the example neuron. You can see this neuron has this ramping activity selective for the lick right movement um, during the delay period. Jia then developed a procedure that allowed her to register her recordings uh, into a common uh, uh, brain coordinate system. And here is a summary plot that shows all her recorded neurons. Uh, these individual blue and red dots shows individual recorded neurons and the color indicates the direction preference of this neuron during the delay, and the size of the dot indicates the strength of the activity. And as you can see, at in, at in first order, the preparatory activity is quite distributed, but we did see an enrichment of preparatory activity in certain patches of the cerebellum. And these are highlighted by these yellow circles. If I flicker these on and off, and hopefully you could visually appreciate, there is a concentration of this large dot in these areas. And these areas, uh, are around Cruz 1, 2, simplex, and posterior vermal regions, exactly covering the regions with a conjunction of input-output connectivity to ALM. Okay, we can quantify this more precisely by aligning the activity into the connectivity map. If we take all the neurons from these hotspot regions, these are patches with 
conjunction of input output connectivity, we then see robust ramping activity during the delay. In contrast, if we take neurons from regions that only receive ALM input, then these regions don't exhibit preparatory activity. And if we take neurons only from regions that project back to ALM but do not receive ALM input, these regions also don't exhibit preparatory activity. So these data tell us that the cerebellum is not simply inheriting activity from ALM. In fact, there are many regions of the cerebellum that receive strong ALM input, but somehow these regions do not sustain preparatory activity. At the same time, we think cerebellum is also not upstream to ALM. There are many regions of the cerebellum that projects to ALM, but if they don't receive ALM input, then they do not carry preparatory activity. Rather, we think it is the these cerebellar hotspot that through their reciprocal interaction form a functional network with ALM. And it is this reciprocal interaction between these regions and ALM that mediates the directional leaking. Okay, so what does this mean you know, all together? So let me put this all together for you. This is how we're thinking about volitional movement at the moment. So I told you about discrete attractors in frontal cortex and these discrete attractors, they encode learned actions. We found that these discrete attractors are not fixed entities. Rather, they seem to be dynamically activated by a ramping input. We currently think this ramping input is coming from the cerebellum, and we think it reflects an internal model of learned actions within specific context. So this thinking is partly me, uh, also motivated by this divergent and convergent connectivity between cortex and the cerebellum. So what this means is that any spot in the cerebellum could receive diver convergent input from widespread areas of neocortex. I think it makes, this feature makes the cerebellum ideally suited to learn associations and form internal models that predict the future. And in turn, the cerebellum project divergently to many cortical areas. So the cerebellum is in a position to send a ramping input to define cortical regions to the essentially define a set of potential action that's available to the animal in specific context. So in this scheme, when we plan actions from moment to moment, the full extent of our motor repertory is actually not available to us. If, for example, in the licking task, the animal can only prepare licking movement in the presence of one particular ramp. But imagine if they're engaged in a different task, evolving a different ramp, then this would perhaps um, evoke an entirely new set of attractors, which would define a, a set of potential actions in a different task. So this is a working hypothesis where we're, we're kind of currently pursuing experimentally. All right, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions. That's marvelous, Neil. Thank you so much. And please just go ahead and raise your hands if you have a question for Neil. Um, let me let me start. I guess uh, the the ramping activity, um, as models of uh, decision making go, that was the, the one I'm familiar with is a work of Paul Chizik that describes ramping activity as a um, a uh, urgency signal, and of course he he relates it to the activity in the basal ganglia. Um, what's surprising to me is your 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 link of the ramping activity to the cerebellum, because I thought you showed that the ramping activity is not because it's orthogonal to the decision uh, uh, axis. So therefore it has no decision element in it. Um, so can you explain, I guess, why would this, uh, how would the cerebellar activity be linked to this ramping activity if, if, the, if the ramping activity doesn't carry decision information because of course it's orthogonal. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I should say there is a longstanding history of studying this ramp and ours is one potential hypothesis where, you know, we think, you know, where these are, I think are all experimentally, you know, testable uh, hypothesis. The way we think about the ramp is that, you know, timing is a part of the kind of learned action within a particular task, right? The animal not only learn what are the appropriate action within a task, but they also learn about which what should be the timing of that action? So I think, you know, perhaps it, you know, we do think the ramp uh, is also carrying a timing function. One evidence we have for this is that it kind of um, 
it correlates with the animal's reaction time in this task. Even in the acute task, when the ramp is a little bit higher, the animal then is able to perform the action a little bit quicker. What do we think ramp is doing in addition is that it is, we think it is perhaps an input that shapes the energy landscape of the, the net uh, of the uh, motor system. And this energy landscape would define multiple attractors, perhaps, not just one. Not, so in, in that sense, it is not instructive as to what exact, action, what exact action to do, but it provides this permissive signal that shapes the energy landscape upon which you can do rapid action selection. Um, so that's how we're thinking about the ramp at the moment. Um, this would you know, postulate that there would be multiple versions of this ramp if you get the animal to do a task, to do different tasks. And uh, that's something we're, we're currently looking into, yeah. Thank you, Noel. Wonderful. Dan, you have your hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I know a really beautiful talk. Um, there are some nice parallels between this contingency reversal work and uh, my paper with Shulu Sun, where we showed how preparatory activity indexes um, motor memories in the, in the form of curl fields. Yes. Um, and I've gotten some questions about it from colleagues and I haven't been sure how to answer. So I figured I'd uh, ask you about it. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things is in, in the monkey version of these delayed reaching tasks, usually the, the reach target is always up on the screen. So it's not really a, a memory task. And the idea is, is often the way that we frame it is that the preparatory activity, you know, going back to work from Evarts and Tanzi is that you're setting reflex gains, you're initializing peri-movement dynamics, in this case, indexing motor skills. You're, you know, Mark Churchland has a nice review on the way that the null space encodes a lot of this. Um, there's quite a bit of auxiliary information in the null space about the movement context as well. Um, so anyway, I guess in your task though, I think it maybe is challenging to know what's motor preparation, you know, in terms of computations related to the movement itself that appear always even in like a reaction time version of the task with no delay period versus I guess, remembering the stimulus or the stimulus response association during the delay period when the stimulus is absent. So I, I'm just curious what you think. Are we studying overlapping pieces of the same computation or are you thinking of this more as persistent activity to remain, to retain the stimulus response association? Yeah, very good uh, question. Let me break up your question into two pieces. Uh, uh, I think the first piece I may be able to more readily answer, which is kind of the nature of these uh, delay activities. So, you know, I should clarify in the version, in this version of the task, the delay, there is a long delay period, about a second. There is no stimulus present during this period. We also looked at things like the animal's oral facial posture. There was no differences across task context. So it seems like the animal is kind of in terms of their, you know, states, they're really in a similar state. And, and when they initiate during the preparation, the only thing differs is the stimulus history and the task rule. You can look at ALM delay activity to see whether this activity correlates with action versus stimulus. You can do this using correct and error trials where they two would be opposite. And uh, you know most of the delay activity is encoding, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's correlated with upcoming choice. So we do think this activity, majority of this activity is reflecting um, motor preparation. There is a deeper question about what is the nature of this activity, and I think you know, um, you know, what are these different node dimensions encoding? It could be encoding task context. We think the part of the node dimension is perhaps encoding task context in this uh, beautiful paper uh, that you guys had that perhaps indexes the animal's memory. Um, and uh, um, there is a, a you know, and and I think what this calls for is that it, you know we should do a better job of defining what exactly we mean by those. No, you know, it, no space is very mm -hmm. large, right? And some yeah. of them, I think, could serve a computational role. But I think uh, we currently um, don't do a good enough job in defining that space. And I think what this work calls for is a better definition of that space. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Sasha, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, nice talk. No, um, what about a better definition of cerebellar nucleus uh, outputs? And in particular, my question is um, about ramping from dentate versus vestigial in the mouse. So as you know, like uh, Crystal Parker and um, others have really seen a lot of ramping in the dentate and uh, not so sure about the vestigial. So really curious about, about that. Right. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, we um, 
we also see ramping in the dentate uh, and in the vestigial. Um, and uh, I should say um, um, the way we think about this ramping activity right now, and we could be wrong, I think we need to still, you know, it's, it's an open question. Um, I think it's not really a labeled line type of model in that there are dedicated cells computing the signal. So, you know, if you, I, the way I think about cortical cerebellar interactions now is that, you know, these, it's essentially the functional network is defined by the task. And essentially uh, the, the cerebellum is, um, you know, perhaps using cortical input to, de to detect and learn internal models of appropriate actions. So, and depending on the motor effectors and particular task input, you could engage um, vestigial nucleus or dentate nucleus in a task specific manner. And uh, I guess the, the, the to, in order to really test that hypothesis, you would really have to put the animal to get the measurement from the same animals and show that you can engage one area versus the other in a flexible way. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. I, I, I... Um, not not really, but okay. uh, that's that's okay. Uh, let me let me follow up. Um, so vestigial um, is getting input from uh, um, from both vermis and Bruce one, and dentate gets its input from. Uh, um, uh, at least the ones that are responsible for the ramping guys in the ventral part are getting input really from Cruz one and Paraflocculus, actually. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, and, and the, the dentate really is thought to be more of a voluntary kind of high level versus the vestigial, which is like, like a gong. It's sort of like timing is now. So you've got your behavior. Right. So what's the dentate component and what's the vestigial component of your lick behavior? And can you dis, 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 disentangle that? And then the final sort of obvious question is, have you tried selectively inactivating dentate or vestigial neurons that um, project to uh, the VM or whatever it is that you think right. is mediating this thing? We have not done a projection specific silencing uh, due to, um, uh, we haven't gotten that to work very well in our hand. We have looked at the individual contribution of vestigial and dentate. In fact, we did, um, uh, we found dentate virtually plays very little role in this behavior. We have done lesions of the dentate. We have uh -huh. done activation of the dentate and uh, we, we just couldn't get any behavior effect. Okay, because it's like such a simple behavior. It's left versus right. It's not some specific kinematic thing. And so the vestigial yeah. should be able to and, handle it. And it's Great. not Got to it. say dentate is not anatomically connected with ALM. What we see is that when you perturb dentate, there is a big activity change in ALM, but that yeah. activity change is orthogonal to these coding dimensions that I'm talking about. And then that activity quickly recovers. So it's as if, I think, these systems are highly interconnected, but how they're functionally interacting, perhaps are long task relevant dimensions really dictated by the task, which is, I guess, I, I what I'm trying to trying to say. Yeah, got it. No, I, I, I like that. It, if there's not any other questions, I can't see the thing, uh, but- uh, um, A couple uh, more questions. Okay, let, are... let other people do it then. Thank Great, Sasha. thank you. Atharva, you have your hand up. Uh, hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it was a beautifully flowing talk, sir. I uh, got to understand most of it. Uh, uh, I have a doubt that the plots that you showed uh, were from choice uh, that the mouse make or the cue that is presented. Oh, can like you... the, uh, the left and right, the difference that you see between the activity the plots are from the movement that the mouse makes or the cue that is presented uh so the um those uh are so the, what i'm showing you is only the correct trials and those are um sorted by the direction the animal licked um what i didn't show you are the uh, uh activity on error trials in which um it's an opposite sensory stimulus, but the animal still licked in the same direction. And generally, for most part, we still see activity that predicts a lick direction. Yeah. Uh, the short so, answer. I, like in the the 
leg direction that is predicted by the cue or the actual wrong direction that the mouse moved in. Like if the cue was right, but the mouse moved towards left, what sort of preparatory activity do you observe in ALM? It would look like the activity on correct leg left trials. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not independent of the cue, but it predicts movement. Right, right, yeah. And by tube, you mean the stimulus to clarify, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. It, um, most of the delay activity seems to be correlated with leg direction. Uh, yeah. So what happens like uh, when it makes a wrong trial, do you see an update in the preparatory activity? Like if you perform a trial by trial analysis or something like that, then do you see some changes in particular direction in the preparatory activity? Do you see a more difference now in the next trial? Right. There, there must be some feedback that goes into that wrong trial, right? Oh, I see. You're asking about the, you know, what the effect of an error on the subsequent trial. Yeah. We yeah. have not really um, in highly trained animals. It we uh, you know we we haven't looked at that um, really closely. Uh, we're doing experiment now to track ALM activity during the course of learning, and that's something we're very interested in. Uh, but so far, I don't have anything there interesting effects that we found that I could tell you about. Yeah, uh, but the, I agree that's a very interesting direction that how these uh, CD are learned uh, through errors. Uh, Thank you, Atharva. Well, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Gabriel, you have your hand up. I do. Thanks for the fascinating talk. So you showed that when you change the, the context, you change the, the choice dimension in regards to the sensory motor contingency. And I'm wondering if you've ever tried changing the temporal context, for example, stretching or, or compressing, you know, making the, the mouse wait longer or go faster. And if you think that would also change the choice dimension, or if you think that there's something fundamentally different about the temporal context versus the sensory motor context. Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, this is somewhat related to Reza's question earlier. Um, I will tell you what we have done and how we're thinking about this in our you know, current you know, um, the, the framework I showed. So if you change the temporal delay, the animal learned the delay you see a stretching of this activity, but it's not a, a, a simple stretching. So what we find is that if you, if the animal has never experienced a delay change, if you train them with a short delay, then you test them in a long delay, then what you see is not a simple stretching of the ramp, but rather you get a rotation of this coding dimension. Very similar to what we see with a contingency reversal as they learn the new ramp. Um, I know there's much kind of, there's a, a kind of a long line of work looking at the motor timing signal. If you have the animal do a reaction time task, the slope of this ramp scales of the reaction time. But I think in those cases, the animal know it's doing uh, the same task and it's it's kind of using the, the, it's kind of essentially just doing a timing task. It's not, you know, if you, what we find is that if you train them to first time experience this delay change, across learning, you do see a rotation of the CD. So I think this choice dimension is reflecting something about the animal's memory of the task, that in each task, it's kind of learning a particular coding dimension. So just as a follow-up, so if you're in a context where, where the mouse is just you know changing the delay and it knows what it's doing, so it's just changing the slope of the ramp, and your hypothesis is that cerebellum is sort of choosing different attractors for different contexts, would you then in that case, in that context, uh, predict that cerebellum would not influence the mouse's ability to switch between different delays? I think in that context, my prediction would be it's one model that's one internal model that's doing the different delay. Then in that case, it's perhaps it's the brain's computing a, a ramp to kind of essentially that 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 encode the timing. Um, I, you know, I I think the cerebellum should be involved. I, we we've never done that version, but I think the literature suggests it would be involved. But but I in, in I guess in my mind, I, I think the animal in that case would be doing one task, and you would see one dimension. You would have you know essentially this. You would see one dimension that 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 encode this particular ramp for that task. 
Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. That was Newell. Thank you so much for that magnificent presentation. Great. Thank you for the discussion. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it as well. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone.